This week on the Notorious Scoundrels podcast. Okay, all the time. Okay, yeah, okay. If you say all the time, then it is a hot take. If you say some of the time, then it's like common knowledge. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about all the time, but I definitely. I didn't argue in your hot take, man. Welcome to the Notorious Scoundrels, a podcast focused on tactics and competitive play for Star Wars Legion. Hosted by Kyle Dornboss, Michael Barry, and David Zelenka, with Jay Shalansky, the man behind the glass. Hello and welcome back to Notorious Scoundrels. I'm Kyle and I'm here with David and Jay this week. How are you guys doing? What's up, man? I'm doing great. Hi. <laughs> Full of energy. Energy abound. <laughs> I'm excited because we are going to talk about some droids this week. And Beep boop. I, I mean, Roger, Roger. <laughs> yeah, wrong, wrong droid. Come on. Um, uh, yeah, I'm excited. I love I love me some separatists. So uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about sprues because that's extremely relevant to droids. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Invader League. Um, and we're also going to do a new hot take section. Um, cause we know you guys love hot takes. So, uh, but first let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the usual bits, if you'd like to support us on Patreon, go to the fifth trooper.com. You can also find all sorts of other fun things there, like, um, uh, blog articles, uh, battle reports, uh, also sorts of good things on there, uh, as well as some six by four gaming mats, which you can turn into six by three with table runners that we also have. Oh, yeah. Um, so, oh, oh, on that, we actually, so we met, like, we were kind of doing a pre-order, quote-unquote, Kickstarter, you know, for that to make sure to, to get enough orders to order them, and we did it. So we're officially placing the order, and everything's good to go, and it's very exciting. That's great news, man. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and if, 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 you're, in, if you're in other countries and you can find... Um some other people to like combine shipping on. Uh, I think you'll do that too, right? Yeah, we actually got a pretty big order from Australia. And so we're going to be just direct shipping to them. And yeah, it's because I'm, I'm working on it. I, I, I have um, a meeting next week. I'm a big wig over here having meetings. Uh, <laughs> I got a meeting next week with the Postal Service, the United States Postal Service. I don't know if you guys have heard <laughs> of them. Uh, but they're gonna they're coming to me they're coming to my house uh but we're gonna we're gonna try to figure out how we can ship internationally as well uh on the cheap so i i canada included so i think we're gonna have some more options after next week so once uh you know the pre-sale will be up until we actually get them physically in stock and then they'll just go to regular sale and so hopefully uh within the next couple of weeks we'll be able to offer reduced shipping for our international folks. Awesome. Um, so those are, there's what, five mats right now? Yep. I mean, yep. Yep. We've talked about them before. They all look amazing. Uh, and go check them out. The fifth trooper.com. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we'd also like to plug warfare weekend. So this is a upcoming grand championship in st louis uh and uh they still have open slots so if you're interested in going um it's being run by the illustrious brendan france so it's sure to have some awesome terrain and be a super fun event um and uh it's from november 8th through the 10th so that's in like a month um yeah and it is a grand it is a grand championship so that means that there are four High command spots at stake, and also uh, the winner gets a flight, I believe. Um, and yep. appara apparently, so there was also this little nugget in the one of the recent FFG articles that said something like, "Grand Championship winners also get a first round buy at high command." So I don't know how accurate that is, or if that applies to Legion, or if that applies to 2020. Uh, so take that with a grain of salt, but that also could be a what thing. What the what? Well, that's good news. <laughs> yeah, for you and me. <laughs> yeah. Well, what um, I was gonna say, what I was gonna say though, is that um, if if Brandon is is involved, a fun and quality event is sure to follow. 
So go go forth to St. Louis and sling some dice. Yeah, and I know uh, some people that are. I know R one lives. Uh, that'd be Eric Reha lives in St. Louis now. So or uh, Corgi, sure he'll be there. Or Corgi is also there. I think LJ said that yeah. he's going. So there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of fun people there. Yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be a good event. There's no question. And uh, actually, uh, uh, just to do a little cross promotion here. So on our podcast, the Fifth Trooper this week, Evan is a world traveler this week, so he won't be on the podcast. I'm going to have Brendan on our podcast. So he's going to co-host with me and we're going to talk about judging in this new era of, of Legion this week. So it, it'll, it should be a pretty, pretty good cast and I'm sure warfare weekend will come up. So you should ask him about movement steps because that is definitely going to come up. <laughs> and and if he has three full pages in his binder for creature yeah. troopers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so that's Warfare Weekend. The website is um, that's Warfare with an I, uh, so W A R F A I R E Weekend dot com, Warfare Weekend dot com. Uh, go check it out. So, um, you guys got anything? Wah, 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 wah. Yep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, Jay, I'm sure that you could like pull that sound effect from the internet instead of just making it with your mouth, but. Uh, it's, it's better this way. It's, it's, it's all we way. could afford. Budget air horn. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's let's move on to news. Welcome to in the news. All right, so we're gonna briefly talk about Invader League, uh, just how we're doing. If we have any quick takeaways, um, why don't you guys go first? Just super super briefly. Um, I know everybody loves bat reps, but we have plenty of other things to talk about. So. Yeah, I mean, if I may, so before we record, and David and I were talking about, well, n- none other than Tauntauns. And, uh, you know, so David, I faced a Tauntaun list. I lost, but I don't feel like I lost because they had Tauntauns. I just, you know, he was a good player, but they didn't feel um, invincible to me. You know what I mean? When I played them, I felt like uh, suppressing them up and making them panic or reduce their actions seem to really hinder their ability to do what they do. And so I didn't really run into too many issues with the Tons. Um, you know, just the guy I was playing with was pretty good. And so there was some other stuff, but I mean, it was a close game, even with a, a Vader Veers list that I was running. So it was interesting. Um, it just, it made me feel better though about facing them in the future because I don't I they're good don't get me wrong but I don't feel like they're invincible yeah they're not insurmountable um suppression like you mentioned is a huge problem for them shooting them is generally good and I mean Kyle you and I were discussing this uh, earlier as well um tauntauns do kind of force you into an attacking style and that means you have to stick your neck out first which can go badly for you yeah, there, you know, there's just, and this is this is why I've previously said that Tauntauns don't really fit my play style. Like, you can't really, I mean, you can sort of defend with Tauntauns, but if you get Moisture Evaporators and you Blue Player, you're still pushing with Tauntauns. You know, you're going to, like, you, you can't just sit on your Vaps and wait for your opponent to come with you. If you to come to you if you've got three Tauntauns. And just um, run your taunts in circles behind your moisture <laughs> evaporators. Well, I mean, you you could do that, but you odds could. are, <laughs> odds are, if, if if you've taken three tauntauns, probably your opponent has a little bit of a range or a firepower advantage on you. So unless you're just like, you know, if there's a big enough line of sight blocker where you can just straight up hide behind it, um, maybe that's one thing. But you, most good maps don't have, you know, an enormous right. like, you know, one foot wide line of sight blocker. Um, so like it just it it pushes you a little bit into that we've talked previously on the show about like the beatdown versus the control, and the beatdown mm-hmm. player is the one that sort of makes things happen. Um, if you bring in three tauntauns, you've basically committed to being the beatdown player before the game even starts, regardless of what uh, you know the battle cards end up shaking out like. So um, don't get me wrong, like obviously it can work. Tauntauns are great. I don't think we're saying they're not. Um, well, but, I think I think great players will see the value in a lot because they're uh, a lower price point for the unit. Um, you know, I think the value lies in maybe using them in certain situations as distraction pieces 
and then moving forward with the rest of your army to you know to take whatever objective that you need to take at that point yeah and i mean ram is good but it, it doesn't really work against armor especially tanks like yeah sure i'm gonna side arc a tank you know maybe i do one wound but then i can't abuse the engagement rules to hide myself amongst the ranks of the enemy so i'm i'm vulnerable if i do that and i mean like i mean i guess the ultimate point of the conversation is tauntauns are not unbeatable and you know they're a, a good unit in the hands of a bad player is a bad unit and a good unit in the hands of an exceptional player is an exceptional unit yeah and i think we've alluded to this before too i think people are not using their harassing kit enough I mean, they shoot four red dice with sharpshooter one, with yeah. relentless. Like that's that's the <laughs> same. That's literally the same thing as maximum firepower. Yeah. Without the impact. You, you got to uh, look your opponent in the eyes and say maximum firepower while rolling that shot. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, they're they're max firepower pistols basically. So. Especially uh, if they're empire, just just to rub it in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my my tauntaun pistols shoot as well as your AT AT uh, call in shot does. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, you know, I think we'll see Tauntaun play evolve a little bit, but I, I, I watched a little bit of your game, Jay, and my recollection is that he basically just ran them at you. Is that more or less accurate? Yeah. And I, I actually panicked two units of them and they Ooh. basically did nothing. Uh, the third unit got in and started mixing it up, but, I, but by that time it was too late. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I did fine and I, I had it right to the end, but quite frankly we i think we went like four hours and change because we both agreed that we wouldn't use the time clock and at, towards the end i i think i made some mistakes and he was just pretty relentless with pushing forward and i was just like i i, uh, I don't know what's going on <laughs> like you know uh, <laughs> but it was just um but yeah i mean i made two units panic and they were in they just did nothing for that whole game so yep yeah and if you've got mortars and or um vader yeah. You know, with Master of Evil, that's a very doable thing. So um is that your is that your if you had a takeaway from your early invader games, is that it basically? Yeah. It's that um, you know, all the hype, I honestly hadn't really played, you know, we messed around them with them a little bit, but I hadn't really played someone who played them decently yet. And this was the first time I had and Going in, I was a little nervous, but then after playing it, you, you kind of see through the cracks a little bit, and you're like, okay, I know how to deal with these guys. You know, it's not going to be perfect, and it's not going to work every time, but it, they're easier to deal with than I think most people, especially as an Empire player. Let me say that. As an Empire player, they're easier to deal with than I originally anticipated they would be. Well, and certainly as a Vader player. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> They uh, I mean, they melt to lightsabers like most things, so you know, there's that. If you find a unit that doesn't do that, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to run that unit. <laughs> uh, what about you, David? Uh, I've done more casting than I've done any actual game playing. Although I'm starting to to finally get my matches organized this week. Um, in the games that I've covered, I've covered a fair number of CIS versus. Uh, Civil War faction games. Um, they've both gone relatively poorly for the droid player, but that is almost 100% due to mistakes on the droid player's part. Um, I think they're quite competitive, even, even with the limited range of models they have now. Um, the <laughs> Grievous is just amazing, and Dooku, you know, we don't have all of his cards yet, but uh, in the game that I saw... Dooku really kick butt in. It was one of those silly things where Obi Wan is trying to handle Dooku, and Dooku is just force pushing him away and continuing to, you know, go on his merry journey through the ranks of the clone troopers, lightening them, and then following up with a force choke, and then getting it back, getting it all back because he has Master of the Force. So, yeah, it's interesting. He's. I'm excited to see what what other cards he has, but he's he's sort of like a cross between Palpatine and Vader, right? Yeah. Like, he's He doesn't have the raw, like, you know, on the move melee power that Vader does, but he's got some more control elements, you know, and he's got lightning with scatter. And he's, he's got, master, got Master of the Force too, so. 
he's got that ridiculous move where he like hits you with lightning and pushes you speed two. Ochi does, and and he gets gives dodges to things around him, and yeah, he's just he's just great. And I think the, I think the lightning is the key more than the melee. His melee is very respectable, but the force lightning is really really good. Yeah, and it's got scatter too, so it's like a range two force push in some ways. Yeah, it can, in the sense that it like can put enemy units closer to Grievous, because in these lists that we're running, that we're seeing currently are Grievous Dooku, because they simply need to be, I think. But it's been it's been quite exciting to watch him work, and I think when we get him fully spoiled, I think he'll be a, a force to be reckoned with, for sure. Totally. Yeah. But, uh, you know, as far as takeaways go, uh, tanks are good on the on Breakthrough, but when you have Impact 2 rear and you run out of time and your opponent's sniper team rerolls into two additional crits it's kind of hard to keep that tank alive to break through at the last minute sorry lj um lj got uh destroyed at the last second by a uh, huntsman and and this was also funny because huntsman had skewed towards ion for this game it was Joris versus empire and so huntsman brought uh, four ion snow troopers, which um, you would never think of, let alone have ever seen a table in the real world, at least as far as I can recount. Um, but because of the nature of the league, you can skew your lists in advance against whatever faction you're playing. And of course, droids are vulnerable to ion. And uh, man, it is it is strong against droids, especially the snow troopers, because of steady. And with steady, they have enough economy to recover, move, and shoot. You know, albeit it's one move, but it's usually enough. Um, and it, it's even better because, like, you'll get in situations with Empire where you can pin down an enemy unit and then hit them with two ions before they activate, and they just lose their activation. So it, it's it's pretty amazing. So list tailoring. Um... Religion. Yeah, that's a thing. Yeah, that was that was my primary concern. Um, I would I would have played them if if the Discord bot gave them to me, but uh, I I give props to LJ that um, you know he's doing it voluntarily, um, knowing you know the round robin format and the fact that that's a possibility. So honestly, I got discouraged from playing clones for exactly that reason. Even though I really, really like clones and I really, really like all their kit and I really, really like Obi, um, I just felt like I couldn't actually win the league if I played the Clone Wars factions because of the limited range of models. Yeah, I think it's fine for like eliminations where everybody's locked into a list because your opponent is not going to be able to tailor specifically to you. Um, but in round robin, where you know in advance who you're playing and on what map and what faction they are, it's a little bit of a different story. Yeah, it was a, it was especially chilling to that idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, but hey, that's that's the event, man. That's not has nothing to do with the faction. That's just the event. Yeah, you know, and it's the nature. I think it's 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 more of a feature than a bug with Invader League. Like it makes round robin really interesting um, because you can experiment with a bunch of different things, and it it adds like a whole element of like map scouting and stuff like that. Right. Uh, which I think is pretty fun, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely different as far as list construction is concerned. And you know, it's sort of a at least at the moment, you know, with their limited model range, sort of a unique weakness for the Clone Wars factions. Yeah, that said, when CIS and and clones have been played and they get their stuff off, it's it's pretty phenomenal. I mean, nine, ten hit fire support shots are pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so it'll be one. Yep. I, I, you know, it's really funny. We talked about clones last week, and I, I, I had forgotten actually that Ceresu Mastery works in melee. Yeah. Oh my god, that makes my opinion of Obi Wan so much higher because wow, like, could you ever engage him with your own Force user, and imagine coming out of it alive? <laughs> like, well, you certainly don't want to. Yeah, you certainly don't want to. You know, um, because you're gonna you're gonna take those def that deflect damage in addition to a saber. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal what he can do. He's a really good character. Yeah, I mean, think I mean, about how, yeah. how how precious those wounds are in a 
in a force user duel and you know def like it's it's a chance for a free wound straight through your saves so yeah yeah and, and while you're while you're attacking it's it's wounding yourself on your turn which has always been the problem with fighting anything with deflect because of the amount of tempo it steals like not only did you do no damage you also took damage <laughs> yeah it's like the same reason with palpatine you're afraid to zap luke when he's got a dodge token Yeah, so I mean, my takeaway from Invader is definitely that, um, you know, clones and droids can do it. The event is chilling them out a little bit, but I think they can they can hang. I think that's the most promising thing about them, right? Is right now with how much Empire and uh, Rebels have that they can even hang with what they limitedly have right now. It's crazy. Yeah, I think it's a good sign for both of them. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of that has to do with the strength of their lead characters. Like if Grievous was any weaker, you know, or if um or if Obi-Wan was any weaker, I don't know if we'd be saying the same thing. But I mean, clone token sharing is is great <laughs> and well, being able to have orders to everything is great. Like the things that are unique about the factions make them competitive. Yep. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and we'll we'll definitely get to that with uh, coordinate and um, separatists here in a minute. Yeah. Um, just for me, I think my one takeaway is, uh, so I've, I've only played two games so far, but I've, um, in my first game, I did uh, just rotaries with Luke and Z6s and snipers. And then my second game was actually Leia Sabine with an FD turret and snipers. Um, snipers are still good. <laughs> <laughs> They're really good. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, we talked last week about this, but like, I think Rebel players still need to be taking two, if not three, snipers. Um, because like, if you run, you know, like look at look at pre-sniper nerf, how effective like death troopers were, right? They were pretty darn effective. Post-sniper nerf, if you're not bringing snipers to the table, you know, you're essentially leaving like the primary counter for units like death troopers in in your in your bag and um, if that's the same can be said of short troopers, which are basically just like range three death troopers. Um, so, you know, you look at like what's popular for Empire right now, it's short troopers, it's mortars, to some degree death troopers, all of those things get countered by snipers, even though snipers are still, you know, even though they're four more points and they're range five, it's still range five, which is 30 inches, they still have sharpshooter and they still have fierce. Um, so they're still good. Rebel players, you, you know, don't, uh, don't just, Take them out of your list. Um, they take a little bit more finesse to play now. They're not quite as far and forget as far as positioning and stuff is concerned, but they're still a really important part of a list, especially a rebel list. Yeah, can I briefly mention Peter Lyons at Moab using his uh, Mark IIs to fire support his sniper shots? Like, that's pretty dope. Like, that's a cheap commando right there. It takes a little bit of tech, but that's, like, better than commandos. It's six black one white critical two sharpshooter search or critical two sharpshooter pierce one like there's a lot of good keywords in that in that pool yeah the critical is kind of relevant there but generally if you can set that up that's going to be a pretty strong um dice pool yeah you know it's funny uh i came to the same conclusion so one of my other invader leagues was a uh, empire gun line and he had three snipers in it and at first i was like ah this will be fine and then, uh, yeah, no, it wasn't fine. They're still good. So, <laughs> yeah, I've been taking Hunter on my snipers recently. That's my that's my tech. Um, bombard plus Hunter snipers usually equals dead mortar. That's kind of what I've been trying to experiment with. It's just like, how do I generate a lead early? Well, if I can pop a mortar in like the first few few you know opening moments of the game then I've already created a lead. Yeah, and mortars with those relays are sort of the uh, the mortar that holds the brick wall that is short troopers together. Um, yeah, and it works better than a jammer because I don't have to actually engage with my tauntauns to make it happen. Right. Same tech works against e-webs, and it also um, it tears the heck out of white safe characters. So like... You know, you can just pick up Krennic or pick up Leia, you know, because you have these hunter snipers chasing them down. 
Yeah, because you're, you know, especially if you can, like, actually take an aim action, you're looking at pretty pretty good chance of getting two hits, and they're not going to save both of those, most likely. So, yep. Um, chunking off two damage a shot with a uh, yeah, sniper's pretty good, pretty good deal. Yeah, so this is tech that I'm going to mention this that Nick Freeman used at a, the Depticon in, you know, this year. So I don't think this tech ever really went away. And he also used them with uh, Recon Intel because they could tag objectives on the first turn. And so they, they really have a, they're a great little multi-tool. They're kind of a Swiss Army knife unit. Really, really good. Um, even with the points increase, I think they're still worth looking at, like, you, like we've been saying. And I've, I've, looked, I've looked at running two alongside three Tauntauns, and I haven't looked back since. Yep. Yeah, I think um, at least Rebel players should be, should be running two still. Um, I think that I think that uh, Empire players it's a little bit less necessary, although they're yeah. still really good for Empire players. But I actually think the short the short trooper mortar. Um, <laughs> well, let's let's get into our hot take section. Yeah, Raider is way higher than everything else. Like Tauntauns, Leia's two pip polishes many a turd. It's not like you can just delete Luke and put in two Tauntauns and that's a net gain necessarily. You know it'll be the Salt City because I'll be there. They Dang still it, hit Kyle. Like they I'm going to sell you <laughs> on fire support with mortars. So many aim 40. tokens, we can't say it on the radio. Yeah, I think, I think... <laughs> Come at me, bro. That's a lot to unpack. Maybe we should just burn the whole suitcase <laughs> instead. Thoughts, Jay? Yep. Uh, the same. <laughs> Nothing but the best best analysis right here, folks. Yeah. That's a uh, that's a good drop, Jay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, I know. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna use this section occasionally. We're not gonna do this every every episode. Um, first of all, if anyone wants to like comb through our previous episodes and should suggest quotes for the hot takes uh, drop. Or like a different one, um, or if you want to make one yourself, feel free to do that. Um, we will take all comers. Yeah, um, yeah. Any amount of work and, uh, we can offload on the unsuspecting public. <laughs> I was just about to say. I was just about to say, uh, if you want to do work for us, we appreciate it <laughs> for for nothing except for a thank you on one of the episodes. So you know. Oh yeah, we'll give you we'll give you a shout out. Um, you know, for painting our fence. Um, yep. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so just a little caveat here. This is a hot take section slash segment, which means that this is our opinion. Alert, alert, hot take <laughs> incoming. So this is the yeah, first time you guys have alerted people of this before. You just went willy nilly as our cut would uh, describe there. <laughs> yeah, 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 we, yeah. Did, we just blundered in yeah. the last few times we did this. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, and, and uh, certainly... It's not like we previously have not said things that are outrageous. We're now just like creating a separate spot to do it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, and we're, I'm sure we're going to continue saying outrageous things on the rest of the show. I believe it. We're, we're, we're creating an unsafe space. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. So here's here's my hot take for the day. And I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this. Um, the short trooper mortar is better than the sniper strike team. Agree 100%. Uh, I'm following you, but I don't know if I can go all the way with you on this. Okay, so why do you agree, Jay? Uh, okay, here's here's the reasons. I think because they are versatile in when and where they can add to, you know, to the helping of your army. Right, where the sniper, it's like okay, whenever he is gets his order and and. In, is ready to shoot and is in within range five that's when he's gonna shoot but with the mortar i mean they're just giving you so much more versatility with fire support with you know when you're deploying them you can deploy them uh with with, with the shore troopers like that's just they're crazy and and then and then add in you know the comms link on that i mean come on like and then suppressive oh god they're so good because I, th I here's a hot take since we're in this section to go along with this. Suppression is better than uh, wounds sometimes, I think. All the time. I'm saying all the time. Um, hot takes. Boom. Okay. All the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
If you say all uh, the time, then it is a hot take. If you say some of the time, then it's like common knowledge. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about all the time, but I definitely. I didn't argue I your hot take, it. man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hey, that's the Sorry. point of this. We're, that's the point of this segment, right? Um, that's fair. Yeah, I. So first of all, I think without comms relay, this is not a conversation. Um. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the whole like it's the whole like you know, it's the what do you even call it? It's the the dynamo that is the com relay mortar coordinate thing. Right. So it. I mean, it really turns like in every possible way. It turns shore troopers from eleven up to twelve. Um. But if we just if we just want to set aside the comms relay for a second, um. And Jay, you already alluded to some of these other advantages. Um, suppressive means that with, you, with each of these things, you're, you're dishing out two suppression most of the time instead of one. Um, with an aim token, you've got like 95% chance to get some kind of paint on one of those dice. Um, so pretty reliably, you're going to be throwing down two suppression. Um, they don't have pierce, so uh, you're not going to be doing nearly as much like raw damage, especially to red save units. But against white save units like rebel troopers, um, you know, since they have critical one, you've got almost as good of a chance of actually passing a hit through cover. Um, now they're range four instead of five, so that's slightly less flexible. Um, but they're also core units, right? So you're, you can activate them with a core token, which is going to be a little bit more flexible than a special forces token. Um, and they're less points. You know, it's only 36 points or 41 if you, if you do the relay. Um, and a sniper strike team is 48, so... Um, yeah, I think they're, I think they're better than sniper strike teams. I think, I think, a, an empire player could comfortably bring a one or even zero sniper strike teams and they'd be fine if they had, you know, two to four mortars. You can't have four mortars, two to three mortars. I like it. I, I don't think it's a hot take. I think it's, you're just spitting truth here, brother. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Counter, you got any counterpoints, David? I mean, yeah, you kind of you kind of started to mention one of them, which is that it's a core unit, and so you know you you're um, I mean I don't know maybe Empire doesn't suffer as much because you have red saves and medics maybe are slightly better for you because your units are more durable generally speaking. Um, you know, we tried to do that on the rebel side and we're like, man, we're really missing our normal core units if we try to do that. And I think the same holds true for Empire. I think you um I think if you take a three of, specifically the three of, you're starting to lose bodies. Um emplacement troopers only interact with specific objectives. And so in that way they have a similar limitation to vehicles. Um snipers, of course, can interact with every objective. Um Emplacements are horrible on breakthrough, um, unless you're defending. That's definitely true. Yeah, uh, emplacements also have this. Uh, since we talked about tauntauns, I have to mention this. So, as it stands, the withdraw rules say that you're not allowed to use any of your own abilities when you withdraw, which means that uh, emplacement troopers cannot pivot. To withdraw they have to withdraw forward so a yeah, tauntaun it can engage your mortar and be and you can't withdraw if it engages your mortar so you're, it's just stuck there the only thing you can do is melee it and so that's a that's a big vulnerability i think that you have at least against tauntauns and possibly even tauntauns bringing well, jammers if you just suppress those bad boys before they make it to you you're fine <laughs> yeah, I mean, if your opponent, if your opponent A lets you and B doesn't run strict orders, um, I mean, I've I definitely learned that lesson the hard way against Starscream when I first played Tauntauns. It was like, oh, oh shoot, I'm out of my command range and I have four suppression. Oh, hope I don't panic. Oh, I panicked. <laughs> Good game. Uh, but yeah, you know, you have to you have to just be mindful of of what they can't do. Is it, in terms isn't of that like true with damage output, and it, well, I suppose, <laughs> but we're asking, but we're asking the question, we're asking the question: Are they better than the sniper strike teams? And the answer is, in these ways, they are not. But if the if we if we're only concerned about 
how much suppression do I deal and how much damage do I deal, then maybe the statement holds. You know what I mean? I was going to say, we weren't asking any questions. We were saying Kyle's straight up said. <laughs> uh, okay, well, if, if, then, if it's just a bald assertion, then I disagree. I think they're suited to different <laughs> tasks. All right, that's fair. I mean, the for me, the the two the two things that I've noticed as their biggest drawbacks are the ones that you mentioned, as far as like interacting with objectives and um, uh, just the lack of meat. Since they since they do take up a core slot, and the core slots are usually your most defensively efficient slots. Right. They're also a high priority target for sniping themselves because they are three health, generally exposed units that yep. are easy to kill if they are exposed it's at also least from the sniper's point of view it's also worth mentioning that um they're both harder to get in cover because you can't you don't have that second model that you can use cohesion to get cover with mm -hmm. um, and you also can't corner peek them which means in theory they can get one shot unlike a well-placed sniper team which no matter how much damage you do to it cannot get one shot so but kyle i have the solution you just have to abuse the detachment rules to deploy on top of a height two building <laughs> it's it's is it abusing if it's if it's how you're supposed to do it uh okay <laughs> i'm gonna i'm just gonna let that one sit <laughs> i'm pretty sure it was intended to mimic cohesion not uh well i don't know I, I just flat break it but okay yeah so all we know there is that it is not it is explicitly not a for deployment not a cohesion move you're just using the speed one tool as, as a distance Right, so in theory, you could detach up any number of heights from the placement of the original shore trooper unit you're detaching to. Right, up or down. Up or down, yeah, of course, yep. if you play a table like that. Yep. All right, well, that was fun. Yeah, that was a fun little excursion. <laughs> um, so yeah, seriously, if you guys have other quotes of ours from previous episodes, um, we did not go back and listen to all 52 of them to find these uh but if you'd like to um feel free to do so <laughs> and, <laughs> and give us some options um so we're gonna try and do more than one of these uh although this one is pretty good day um so all right let's move on to legion 101 it's time for legion 101 classes in session all right so we're gonna talk about separatists today um the I'm confederacy of though. independent systems yep the the confederacy for freedom from the grip of the republic from the grip of that oppressive democratic organization yes. <laughs> it's, the, it's the bureaucracy they're getting in the way of all this all this free trade and stuff um, of all this profit we could be making exactly yeah I, um all right how are you supposed to like, like scour the outer rim, you know, and, and extort them? Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, all right. It's all this red tape. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Laws getting in the way. Yeah, um, gosh. All right, but seriously. Um, so the meat and potatoes of separatists are B1 battle droids. Because uh, I guess there's no like, you know, actually blood and flesh systems that defected except geonosis um the worst core <laughs> units in the galaxy although maybe not because yes. of the way they're pointed right so um on a individual model basis these guys are objectively the worst right they have a white save with no surge they throw a white dice with no surge um literally like the worst possible and they have one wound and one courage yeah so, they're the lowest stats possible in the game Unless you could somehow make it so that like one wound kills multiple models, which I think would be hilarious for something like Ewoks. Yeah, um, it would. <laughs> then you can't make them worse. However, they're only six points. So yeah. would, it, would, it, would it surprise you if I told you that uh, B1 battle droids are both the most defensively efficient and offensively efficient core unit in the game? I just saw you like putting on your Morpheus glasses. You know, what if I told you? <laughs> that B1 battle trites were like the most defensively efficient units in the game and the most offensively efficient. Morpheus, I'm confused. Could you explain that to me, please? Yeah, so when we talk about efficiency, we're talking about, well, it, def it depends whether you're talking about defensive or offensive. So defensive is essentially like how many wounds on average does it take to kill this unit? Um, 
and then you divide that by how many points they cost. So for example, um, if you had a unit with no save, uh, and it was a six model unit, each of which had one wound, like you want battle droids, um, they, would, they would have six effective wounds, which means that you need to do on average six wounds to them to kill them off. So then you would divide that by their, the points that they cost. Um, so like stormtroopers, for example, you get four wounds for 44 points. Um, and that's eight effective wounds, right? Because they have a, a red save, which means 50% of the time they block and 50% of the time they don't on average. So you divide eight by 44 points. Um, well, B1 battle droids have a, they do in fact have a dice with paint on it, even though it's a crappy one. Um, it's one out of six chance to block. So you divide six by five sixths and you get like seven point something. I forget the number off the top of my head, but basically you divide that by 36 points and they're the single most defensively efficient unit in the game, which means essentially that um, they require the most resources uh, as far as like firepower to remove from the table of any unit for their cost. Um, and you can Barely. kind of... Sorry, go on. Well, I was going to no. say, you, you can kind of feel this anecdotally, right? Where it's like, suppose Luke jumps into a unit of stormtroopers. On average, he's going to kill between three and four of them. He kills four stormtroopers, and that squad is gutted, right? Like, it's just got a unit leader left. Um, and those stormtroopers, if they got a DLT, they probably cost almost 70 points, right? 68 points. Um, but if you look at, like, B1 battle droids, and suppose you've got a heavy weapon in there, so it's seven dudes, and he kills four battle droids. Like, he's, he's maybe just got them over, you know, below half strength with that um and they're cheaper than the stormtroopers so it's like yay i killed four battle droids all right <laughs> still got still got half my half my unit left kyle i must insist that you use a real world example nobody plays luke anymore Are you, really i okay i don't believe you i i've used him already in invader league he's awesome. i need you i need you to i need you to turn to put this in terms of tauntauns <laughs> all right suppose you have suppose you have your lightsaber wielder that costs two tauntauns <laughs> oh, come on. Um, well, okay. So what, you're, what you're saying is what you're saying is Ram two only potentially kills twelve points as opposed to some larger number of points. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, the like the point is, for as as fragile as these things feel like they should be, they take more effort than they feel like they should to kill. For what you for what you're getting, right? Like, and even if you remove an entire B1 squad from the table, it's like, all right, you know, you still got like 40 droids on the table. Um, is it wrong? Is it wrong to split up your fire between B1 units in an effort to reduce their offensive potential? Uh, yes, because um, unlike, say, for example, the Z6 unit, they're like, if you, if you take their quote unquote standard boring uh e5c which is just three black dice um their damage is backloaded to that heavy weapon like if, if you kill a droid you're removing a no surge white die and they're still throwing three black dice on the end of that you know it'd yeah. be like it'd, it'd be like if you were shooting a z6 unit if every time you killed a guy the z6 just lost the white dice yeah so that's just like straight wrong because right. it's so solidly backloaded into the heavy weapon yep because that's black dice occasionally backed up by you know aggressive tactic surge token. Uh, right, which is also another thing like that. Those efficiency numbers um, do not at all factor in surge tokens from aggressive tactics, which are common as dirt because of coordinate. Right, um, and it also doesn't factor in um, things like the impact of Pierce. Right. Like we sort of joke that Wookiees are Pierce immune because they have such a poor save and all of their durability is tied up in their raw wounds. The same is basically true of a of a B1 unit, right? Like if you yeah. if you snipe, if you snipe them and you you Pierce one B1, you've just killed six points. Um, if you snipe a stormtrooper, you've killed ten, and if you if you snipe a or I'm sorry eleven rebel trooper would be ten. Um, mm -hmm. You know if you snipe a shore it's or a clone it's twelve. You know, so you're literally getting like half as much value out of sniping a B1 as you would a clone trooper. Um, so 
it's a uh, they're 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 better than people give them credit for and i think one of the things like if you watch some of lj's games from invader league you'll notice probably is that people just kind of underestimate the b1s and they focus on grievous and then suddenly they're like swamped in b1s <laughs> nice <laughs> um, so that's a very common outcome and we'll talk about that a little bit um that's a very common outcome in like a, a separatist game right you have your big like hard-hitting focus pieces but if your opponent um like hardcore focuses them and just ignores your b1s they're going to get overrun so um yeah i felt that to be true anecdotally in my games against cis i feel like if i ignore their core units i just get buried in the middle game yeah so you still want to like you know try and kill b1s it's not like you should ignore them um yeah you should always kill b1s if your opponent lets you because again like you said they have no save right so like if you get any damage through it's probably going through so fire right. away and they're super vulnerable to spray um if if you hit them with a flamethrower uh pretty much any flamethrower there's a very good chance that you'll just straight up wipe a unit in one shot no matter how big it is yeah and an average roll from an atrt flamethrower actually overkills a b full b1 unit by about like a quarter of a, a hit or something like that yeah it, it's pretty good yeah so if, if you're a separatist player um you know avoid the flamethrowers yeah you, you watch out because those things will, will melt you down to down to your base parts um they do of course have some drawbacks those being ai primarily um yeah forces them to do a specific thing if they don't have a face up order token yeah um, it's all fun when it's working but then when they don't have the face up order token things go bad real quick yeah, and that's the thing, right? Like that's totally on theme. Um, like when they're when they're firing on all cylinders, they're they're actually fairly efficient. Um, it seems like an uphill battle trying to kill enough of them. Um, but when they don't have order tokens, they're just a total disaster. <laughs> yeah, because generally you don't want to attack as your first action. Like that's not a normal thing. Usually the order is aim shoot or move shoot or dodge shoot. And so AI attack can be very negative for you. Yep. Especially, Especially if the only unit in range is like an ATST, right? Right. Like if you're forced to attack something you don't want to in a way that's inefficient, that can be real bad. Yeah. You basically lose your choice in that situation. Yeah. And sometimes like you need to double move to get to an objective or something like that too. And of course they can't do that if they don't have a face up. So. so once again, props to luke and alex because they've 100 percent captured the flavor and the mechanics yep totally um so let's talk about coordinate because that is how you get around ai and also do other things that are amazing with cis um so we actually did an episode on coordinate um a few episodes ago this was actually i think right after shores came out um so go back and check that out because we talk about separatists also, but we'll talk about it here since it's so integral to their faction identity. Um, you know, essentially it allows, in the B1's case, a, um, a B1 to uh, generate another free order when they receive one and give it to another droid trooper, um, which is at the moment another B1 and will soon be at some point B2s. Um, and then, you know, that, that procs off itself, right? So if you coordinate from one B1 to another, that second B1 also has coordinate. So they then get a free order, which they can pass to another B1. So, you know, we've used the term daisy chaining before, but essentially you can turn one order into six with this ability if you have six B1s, um, which is amazing. Yeah, it like sifts your order pool completely from core units. And so the only things left are not droid troopers. Right, so we actually talk, um, uh, Jay wrote a great article on this um, about like going through an example core set list. So, you know, Grievous, B1s, and Droidicas, and just talking about on each turn when you play a given card, how do you achieve perfect activation control? Um, so uh, the key here is first, um, you'll notice that B1s have a comm slot, and you're going to want one, if not two, uplinks. Um, in pretty much every separatist army, um, somewhere along your B1s, and if you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have to like cut a heavy weapon to do that, and just have like a naked B1 with nothing but an uplink, that's actually important enough to do that. Got to maintain um, your link to the droid control ship. Right. 
Um, no, that's only if you do just a naked B1 with an uplink. That's only forty six points still. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that's an easy that's an easy include. I mean the value is off the charts. Yep. Um, and then generally speaking, you know that squad, especially if it's a naked one, isn't going to have much better to do except recover and hand out that uplink order and maybe like do an objective or something. So, um, which is fine for forty six points. So yeah, let's go a lot of times you attach a rocket to it as well. Just if yep. you want to actually put a heavy weapon there, if you have the points, you can attach a rocket to it because you were going to recover anyway. So it it it's like just a bunch of synergy, right? You've got your uplink, you've got an impact weapon, and you are going to recover anyway. And it's only two points more expensive than the E5C. So you might as well just throw it in there. Yeah, it's actually a great anti-armor weapon. Those things are no joke. Yeah, impact two for 20 points. I mean, every rebel is envious. <laughs> yeah. Like and we wish good. we we wish we had that. Yep, and you're adding it on top of six white dice, so you got some good crit chance there. Um, yeah, like I mean, thankfully, th <laughs> thankfully it changed. We used to have you know that impact three laser that was thirty five points. Oh, on the RT, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Those were the battle days. Luckily, now we have range five FD turrets, which are yeah. still good. By the way, still I still really one. good. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway. Um. Yeah. So yeah. So with with coordinate and um. You know, you just this starts in list building. It's kind of a no-brainer from the core set because you only have three units to choose from. But like generally speaking, with separatists, you want to be thinking about on every single turn, um, like where what's going to be in your bag, what's going to be on the table, um, as far as orders are concerned, and uh, and then um, you know, th like go through all your command cards and make sure that on every turn you can achieve perfect activation control. And know that if you have like two of the same type of token in your bag, that's that's just as good. Yeah, and I found, uh, you know, I played what was it, Yevon Team League. I played the droids, and the thing I found, uh, the mistake I made was not thinking ahead to um, where the droids were going to be. <laughs> you know, and like I, I think I when I was deploying, I, I accidentally. Um, place my two uplinked droids like closer to each other when maybe I should have played them a little bit differently. So, you know, as part of this great activation control is really thinking out how you're going to be deploying and then moving across the board so that you're keeping them a all within range one, but then also making sure if you have one or two HQ uplinks and then where's Grievous and just making sure that that's all lining up appropriately for you. Yeah, so like generally speaking, if if you're gonna and that's why I like two uplinks instead of one, is it gives you more flex in how you how you do your chain. Like if you have two uplinks and they're right next to each other, as long as your other four units are spread out to the left and or right of those guys, you can still chain it, right? But yep. if you have like if you have like one uplink and he's smack dab in the middle of your dudes, you're only gonna be able to chain in one direction. Right. Um, so you gotta think about things like that. Um it helps to do overlap, like make it so that, you know, it's not one unit in range of one unit in range of one other unit. Make sure that it's like a unit is in range of two other units and those two units are each in range of two other units. Um, we've talked in the past about like honeycombing, but think about how like a hex grid looks. And that's basically what you want your B1 chain to look like. Yeah, you don't want like a straight up line because you can suffer a break in the line. And that's very um, bad for you. Yeah, and you can do this with cohesion. Don't forget that abilities are any mini to any mini unless otherwise stated. So that includes coordinate, which means that you know if if you've got your unit leader, you can cohere one B one out to the right and one B one out to the left, and you've got like a eight essentially like an eight inch wide band um, for that B one unit to play with as far as coordinate's concerned. Yeah, so you know flex your flex your wingspan because that's going to help you um, position better. Yeah, and. And we we won't get into this extremely controversial topic here, but I I will just advocate for having some kind of easily identifiable squad marking on mm -hmm. each mini and each of your units, um, especially important for separatists because you're gonna your guys are gonna be like all mixed up together, and if you can't tell who they are and your opponent can't tell who they are, that's gonna be a problem. Yeah, and I would say I everything requires practice. But this is one of those lists that really, um, and this is, I think, Kyle, why you like them so much, is they're just a lot of thought 
has to go into almost every piece of deployment and command hand just to make sure you're doing it right so that you're getting that perfect activation because it can get complex and confusing. Um, you know, I wrote that article and then I, I played a couple games and the first couple games I was playing, I was like, oh, this is a lot. <laughs> this is a lot. Like I was, you know, it, it like kind of took my breath away for a second because I'm like, wait, okay, which one? All right, this guy, you know, and like trying to figure out where to put them to deploy them to push them so that I'm making sure I'm I'm doing everything correctly. So, but if it's the, one of those things, if you become good at it and you've practiced it enough, it's it's a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, it's it's great when it's firing on all cylinders, but it does take some effort and some practice and some some planning in advance to do that. Um, you want to talk about Droidicas? Well, actually, I was thinking because we do have a hobby segment here too on sprues and or airbrushing, both of which are relevant to droids. I was thinking we could actually maybe table because um, we got to wrap this up pretty soon. Table Grievous and Droidicus for next week, and then okay, just hit briefly hit our hobby section. All right, so let's uh, let's do an actual hobby section. Get out your brush and paint. It's hobby time. Uh, all right, so um, <laughs> with droids come sprues, or rather, they come on sprues. Have you guys had the pleasure of assembling them yet? Sure have. <laughs> I have not, but I have seen the sprues in my box as I've been putting together my clones. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit, if you've never done any kind of sprue-based miniatures game like a you know games workshop game like 40k or age of sigmar it's a little intimidating mm. um they are not going to be like you know all of the previous legion models where they come in like three pieces and you just slap the arms on you know they can only go one way um and you throw some super glue in there and call it a day in like two minutes um if that's what you're expecting then that's not that's not what you're gonna get <laughs> <laughs> um the first thing I'll say is read the directions. Uh, that is key. Yeah, I made the mistake of not doing that the first time I did one. I was like, I've done Games Workshop. I got this. And I was like, no, I did this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What's the I was expression? Like, RTFM? Yeah, yeah. I put, I put the body on backwards. I was like, no, nah, nuts. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, read the instructions. Um, I... <laughs> I tried to do the droidicas without doing the instructions, and I was like, wow, these, this is a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that's the first thing. The second is you're going to need some very specific tools for this. Um, so you're going to need sprue clippers. And those are, they look like wire cutters, but they're not wire cutters. Um, you want like actual hobby clippers. You can get them pretty cheaply from Amazon, but essentially what you're looking for is something that looks like wire cutters, but one side of the blade is perfectly flat. Um, They're also called flush cutters for that exact reason. Right, flush cutters. And that's that's so you can put that flush side up against the model and clip it, and then you have to do relatively minimal. I use like a soft um, sanding block you know, that you mm -hmm. can just get at Home Depot in the paint section to just kind of like quickly one pass, shave off that little, that little nubbin um, that gets left from the sprue. And uh, that goes pretty quick once, once you get the hang of it, but you definitely need sprue, sprue, sprue clippers. Please, please do not try and remove your, your B1s from the sprue with an X-Acto knife. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, you will cut up your models. You will cut up yourself. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you will get very frustrated very quickly. <laughs> Yep. Having stabbed um, myself a couple times with my hobby knife, I can uh, attest to this. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, please don't do that. Get some actual sprue clippers. They're not super expensive. Um, you can also get them at your local hobby store, but those tend to be like the the up-priced ones. So I'd recommend mm -hmm. just going on Amazon. Yeah, um, Amazon, like it's a G-U-N-P-L-A. It's the um, uh, Gundam. They make these these kits that are like ten dollars and that has a lot of really good um good tools in there that's what i've been seeing yep yeah those are fine um you also want some plastic glue i know that there are different opinions on this but i prefer personally much prefer plastic glue to super glue for these things um 
I think it's actually an advantage that it doesn't set like immediately because if you mess up, you can kind of like shove the bits around a little bit and they actually do stick together pretty quickly. So um, I find this especially helpful for like their, um, for like the guns, which are in two pieces for the B1s. Um, you know, you gotta... Yeah, my only caveat to that is if you plan on changing stuff in the future, do not use the plastic glue because that really puts them together. Yeah. Um, the the super glues it, it gets especially if you use like an accelerant it'll have kind of a brittle to it so then you can kind of break it up later if you're planning on changing the models just that's just my two or if you on goof that. you can break it off pretty easily yeah um, the plastic glue there's something with the chemistry that causes the two pieces to fuse together yeah which makes them really strong like if you drop them on the floor but it also means if you f feel like you mess something up and you gotta like remove an arm or something you, you gotta use a knife yeah fortunately <laughs> legion isn't isn't uh a, a what you see is what you get kind of rule set so yeah there's no like you know need to change your war gear you know given the what you want to run right i mean you got to have a rocket launcher on the rocket launcher guy but you don't have to like yeah. glue grenades onto their belt or anything like you do for 40k yeah for real um so um yeah, I, I would recommend plastic glue. I also find that like with as spindly as the B ones are, if you do super glue, I tend to glue my fingers together. Um, so that's another reason I prefer plastic glue. You're not going to glue your fingers together, or you're not going to glue your fingers to the model, which I've also done. I'm probably going to get trolled for this, but I've actually had some success with the gel super glues rather than the liquid kind, hmm. and for that exact reason. Um, yeah. And also, if you're getting stuff on your fingers, you're probably using too much. So, you know, less is more with glue, I think. Yep, definitely. Um, so yeah, it uh, takes some practice. You're gonna have to like, if you're using plastic glue, you're gonna have to sit there and actually hold it for a few seconds, um, put on a movie or watch a football game or, you know, watch a, watch some Invader League on, on Twitch. Um, yeah, it has to bond. Yeah, so it's gonna take you longer, um, but you can pose each dude however you want. You can do arm and, like swaps and stuff, um, you know, Grievous comes with like a zillion different options for, you know, lightsabers and guns and stuff like that. So um, it's a little more effort, but your guys are going to all look different, which I love personally coming from uh, Games Workshop games. Um, so, yeah. When you're you done can... with the sprue, by the way, you should cut it up into pieces and either um make it into something terrain like maybe use it as greebles for terrain or just uh i don't know if they're recyclable or not but um don't definitely don't throw it away without cutting it up oh because like animals and stuff get stuck in it that's just my theory i mean i see i see those little i see those little sections and i just kind of think back to the whole like you know cans thing yeah fish fish head in a can can yeah uh, exactly yeah. um yeah, so that's all I have to say about Spruce. You guys got anything to add? No, just be patient. And, uh, you know, if if it's your first time, Adam, it's, it's, it seems overwhelming. But once you get into it, once you've done a couple of the B1 droids, like you're like, oh, I get this. And then it just kind of starts clicking after that. And, and you'll, you'll run through them pretty quickly. Yeah, be patient, cut away from your body and <laughs> just watch your fingers, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but you're not a true hobbyist until you've cut yourself once. That's that's how I feel. Or glued your fingers together once. Yep. I have done that. <laughs> Can confirm. Yep. Yeah. Um all right, cool. Uh did you guys want to talk about airbrushing or you want to save that for another hobby segment? I think we should save it for next week. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, any any final thoughts? Yeah, it, to the point uh, that David was talking about earlier. So they have, um, I think they're like eight or nine bucks on, on Amazon where you could just get a full kit. And they have like the mini like sanding tools as well. And I mean, it, it has everything you could ever want. And so make sure you have the right tools. That's going to be your key to hobbying. Yep. Yeah, you're going to be like, sprues are horrible if you're not using the right tools. Uh, yeah, agreed. So um yeah all right well um next week we'll hit 
uh, the other half of Separatists, which is Grievous and Droidicus. Um, and uh, hopefully Michael will be back and he can join us on that. And um, uh, we will see you guys next week. I am Kyle. I'm David. And I'm Jay. And we are the Notorious Scoundrels. Stay fresh, cheese bags. Join us next week for another episode of The Notorious Scoundrels. This has been a Fifth Trooper production. <laughs>